Hi, I'm Joel Richardson, and this is The Underground. Welcome to this week's episode of The Underground, a program that explores the testimony of the biblical prophets, the gospel of Jesus Christ, current events, and how all of these things relate to you and me. Now, on this week's episode, I'm joined by Samuel Whitfield, and it's that time of year. We have the One King Annual Conference in Jerusalem coming up. We also have a One King Regional that will be down in Fort Pierce, Florida. Mm -hmm. And what are the exact dates for that? That is uh, February 22nd through 24th. Okay, so, so February. Early February. Early, well, late February. Yeah, late February. Uh, 22nd through 24th, and that will be Samuel, myself. Uh, uh, Stuart, Stuart Greaves. And, and uh, Jay Thomas. And leading Jay, worship. Jay Thomas will be there leading worship, which is probably the best part of all of it. Well, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if we're honest. There's nothing, by the way, more amazing uh, if you're not familiar with Jay Thomas, just uh, one of my favorite worship leaders, but to be in Jerusalem uh, at Christ Church there, right, uh, at the Jaffa Gate, just inside the Jaffa Gate, and to hear, to walk down the streets of uh, old Jerusalem and to hear Jay Thomas worship just echoing throughout the city, yeah. it's, that's probably a life memorable moment. It's a moment. highlight, it's a huge highlight. But uh, in any case, so a couple weeks ago, um, I did a program on Trump and Jerusalem, obviously this issue of the United States recognizing Jerusalem uh, as the capital of Israel. We want to be very clear. This is not the United States declaring Jerusalem to be the capital. This is simply uh, the United States, via the Trump administration, via President Trump, recognizing the fact that Jerusalem is the capital of the state of Israel. We talked about that and uh, got a lot of reactions, uh, the majority of which were positive, some negative, of course. Um, and it's impossible to discuss this without uh, Trump becoming the issue, and we want to talk about Jerusalem as the issue. But I wanted to take some time just to sort of return to that and just have a chat with Samuel. So um, here's the thing with, with this whole issue is there is the political side of things. You know, the United States, the state of Israel, I mean, just sort of pulling aside all biblical relevance. There's just the issue uh, of the political side of things. Then there is, again, without the, the Bible or the promised plan of God or without prophecy being the primary issue, there's simply the issue of justice. You know, the, because this issue of acknowledging the state of Israel, um, acknowledging the capital that they say is their capital, to me, this is an issue of justice. But once you start talking about justice, then other uh, brothers and sisters are going to come in and talk about justice for Palestinians, uh, for the Palestinian believers and the Palestinian people, or just, let's just say, um, those who live in the Palestinian territories, to be technically accurate. But behind all of it is the issue of the gospel. And above and beyond everything, um, this is our primary concern. Now, of course, that ties into the issue of justice, and the political side of things ties into it as well. But I wanted just to sort of, um, I always appreciate, Samuel, I always appreciate your thoughts because you're um, someone who thinks, you're a deep thinker, and you're always exploring and feeling out um, issues relevant in the world, political issues, as they relate to the gospel. And again, as followers of Jesus, as disciples, this is our primary focus. This is, you know, we're not saying other issues are not relevant, but this is our primary focus. So throw out some of the different things that you've been chewing on, and um, I just want to sort of bat it back and forth and uh, continue this discussion. Yeah, and you know, the, the thing I love is, is that you brought up the gospel, is that, you know, I, that's the thing that as the church we care about. Where's the gospel in all of this? Mm -hmm. And I love us jumping in the conversation and going, you know, this is a little messy, but how do we find the gospel in the center? So it was interesting. When I was actually in a Muslim country uh, when, when, when the president made the announcement. And there were two things that came to mind. And, and 
One of them is, I think, a factor that very few people are talking about, meaning it's become uh, uh, all about what the president did. And I appreciate what you said is going, that's a factor for sure. I mean, the American footprint is still is still huge in the earth, but but there's other factors at play. It's not just um, just America. And, and here's why I think a lot of people are overlooking. Is there, uh, I'll get it this way, a month before the president makes the announcement, you've got the crown prince of Saudi Arabia going, I think we need a diplomatic channel to Israel, right? And that's been probably one of the worst kept secrets in the last few years. This news story keeps popping up that because of the Iranian threat, there's been an ongoing conversation between the Saudis and Israel. You know, you've got, when you look at, you know, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, you go, you know, like any other leader of a country, you always take risks in policy, but he's, he's, he doesn't want a war in the Middle East. I don't, you know, I don't think Israel wants any kind of war. So you go, the fact that, that Israel didn't call Washington and say, hey, maybe talk about Jerusalem, but, but, but don't actually make this proclamation. Because, again, if, if Netanyahu thought he's going to immediately create a Middle East war, he, he's, going to, he's going to call Washington and say, hey, like, no one really wants a war. Of course right. they want their capital recognized. That's, that's fair, understandable, but they don't want to provoke a war. So the fact that the Saudis are, are kind of starting to say something, the fact the president makes the announcement, the fact that it's uh, the, the fact that when you look across the uh, the Middle Eastern world, sure, there's there's a little bit, but there's there's no massive governmental. I mean, there's there's a little bit of rhetoric, but even this week, you know, the news story dropped that the Egy- Egyptian intelligence were kind of speaking to some media personalities, saying, "Hey, help help us get support behind." This, you know, in other words, don't antagonize people against the Jerusalem proclamation because it's actually helpful for our security. And my point is just this. When you put all that together with the fact that Netanyahu for the last year or two has been saying we are closer than ever to some diplomatic relationships with the Arab world, we see and I think, you know, we're seeing an interesting scenario emerge that the Iranian threat um, is is creating this kind of unlikely bedfellows, as we like to say. But yeah. but we could see some very unusual political alliances emerge in the next in the next couple of years that the Middle East could look very different. I mean, think about it, a year ago, all we could talk about was ISIS. Where we're going to happen now? It's like, is anyone talking about ISIS? <laughs> you know, the conversation changed so quickly. Yeah. So that's the question. I, so. I want to get to the gospel question, but that's the thing I'm asking. What no one's paying attention to is it's not just the American president signed a piece of paper. There seem to be much bigger shifts moving that are giving Netanyahu the boldness to do what he's doing. And what are those going to look like in the next few years? And, you know, I don't have any guess on that, but I think that's one of the big overlooked factors. It's not just America. There's a number of pieces that seem to be moving and are going to relate to Israel in the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let me ask you this question. Um, because this is actually, you know, for a lot of people out there, I think in the prophecy world, this is just a foregone conclusion. But it's a little bit, it's a little bit more difficult to answer with, with absolute clarity um, if we really understand sort of the biblical narrative. But here's the question. Do you believe that by the United States recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of the current state of Israel... Do you believe that that is bringing a blessing onto the United States of America? I know that's the kind of question a lot of people like to ask to say, is there some kind of automatic blessing? Or curse. Yeah, or curse. You know, for me, I think about, here's the lens I think about it as I go, the Lord asked us to bless Israel, right? So then we got to say, what does that mean? And I go, how can, to ultimately bless Israel... I have to deliver, I, the gospel has to be part of that conversation. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, you know, I'm not necessarily convinced there's an automatic blessing. I, you know, and, and we would say, what is the blessing we're looking for? Is it financial? Is it whatever? I don't think we want to be Israel's antagonizers, which I think is positive. Is we, we're not ones that are kind of railing against her. Instead, we're going, no, that's your capital. Like, so we, so I, I'm happy for that. I don't know that there's an, and the Lord does make some strong statements, particularly as, in his end time judgments about yeah. railing against Israel. So I'm, posi- I'm, I'm glad to, okay, let's not rail against Israel and be in the judgment category. Is there an automatic blessing? I, I don't see that because for me, bl- for me it's just kind of going, 
we're, we're, we're at some level of agreement with what God said, right? right? So, I think, so I think it's a positive because it moves us out of a, 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 a negative posture for judgment position. But it, to it bless us, Israel, it, the gospel has to be in there somewhere in my, right. in my estimation. It moves us out of the category of being in alignment with all of the nations which don't do by recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of the current state of Israel, I think what this is, is it is meeting the minimum requirement. Like this is just because it is the capital of Israel. And so all we're doing is acknowledging reality. They already have what the president that. said. We're yeah. kind of acknowledging what's already happened. Yeah. So in, in reality, this is not like we've done this tremendous big thing that's going to automatically bring all kinds of blessing, but it's sort of moving us out of the category of being positioned in a place of potential judgment. You could, you could probably say it that way, um, you know, but it's, this is different than, for instance, you know, guaranteeing that we're going to be just blessed and prosperous. I guess that's my point is yeah. oftentimes we just look at these things through the lens primarily, uh, through the political lens. You know, we think of the American economy or we think of natural disasters and we think if we do one good thing like this, we automatically are going to be spared. And that's not necessarily the case. Right. Um, and, and what's blessing mean? Like, I mean, I... Like you, probably, I mean, I don't want our economy to fall apart, but the Lord may go, hey, your blessing might be five, ten years of economic trouble that make you consider eternal realities, you know. And I don't have an opinion on that, but I'm going, to, even the way the Lord blesses America could be different than we imagine. Maybe he'll be gracious to us in terms of prosperity. Maybe he'll be gracious and go in and actually take away a few things so you'll ask different questions. Uh, we don't know how he'll lead. But he could. But either way, he could actually end up being gracious to us in a way we don't expect. Right. You right. Know? Yeah. And on the day of judgment, ultimately, it's depending on how that works with regard to the judgment of the nations. Um, we don't know how that would pan out then versus yeah. now as well. And, and I don't know. I don't know how you think about that. I tend to think about his judgment of the nations on the final day because when you read a lot of the text, they basically go, "All the nations are against me," <laughs> like, and what you know what. What degree of literalism versus hyperbole? The point is, it doesn't seem like the Lord's going, oh, here's this big section of nations that like me. It, it seems like the final conflict sort of brings out the worst in some ways. I tend to think that when the Lord's going, I'm going to judge the nations, he's going, I'm going to pull out of the nations those who agreed with me. And judge. So in other words, you could have, like right now we might go, Iran is, you know, but within Iran, there'd be a people that agreed with the Lord. Right. Yeah. As he's judging the nations, he'd go, you're my people, though you're da, da, da. Or in America, we could end up, you know, because he's judging all the nations, if we end up in a the situation we end up, there'd still be a righteous remnant from the nation. And so I, I wonder, too, if when he's judging the nations and there's the righteous, it's not necessarily the righteous governments, but it's the righteous in the nations. Yeah. Would that make sense? Okay, so let me throw this one at you. Now, when I did my show, I talked... Um, pretty much only positively on all the positive elements of what I saw, you know, in a, a very positive development. But there's a huge reality um, that I did not talk about going on behind the scenes. And that is the fact that, yes, indeed, there are brothers and sisters, our brethren, Christians, uh, disciples of Jesus living in the Palestinian territories. Mm -hmm. Now, the majority, not all, but by and large, and some of this is because of political, uh, cultural pressure, um, but some of it is because of where they stand theologically, where they already stand theologically. But the majority of the leaders living in the West Bank, the Palestinian territories that are Christians, tended to be in very strong disagreement with this declaration, saying that this is going to cause all kinds of trouble for them, it's going to bring persecution on them, that we as American evangelicals are not thinking about them that because we have, they would say, we have bad theology, we have an overly politicized focus on blessing Israel regardless, they would say that we're causing them trouble. So from the perspective of someone who cares about the situation for believers in the, the Arabs in the West Bank and uh, Gaza and so forth, how do we respond to them? How do we respond to them that say, well, you're just you know, by supporting this, you're being too political, you're not thinking about us, you know, how, how do you respond, uh, I won't name names, but, you know, to these various Palestinian leaders who sort of came out and, you know, sort of, I won't say berated, but sort of um, really tried to issue a guilt trip to anybody that supported it. Yeah, I think there's a couple of factors. So one, as, as you know, as we all know, 
one, Israel is kind of a lightning rod. I mean, second to the person of Jesus, it's probably the most. So there's there's definitely issues that are almost unsolvable there, you know, minus the heart transformation in the gospel. So those are the obvious ones. Leaving that aside, the two that I think we can make progress on is one, I think there has been a tendency in Western Christianity to sometimes kind of go, Israel, we love you. Everyone else is oppressive. And so I think on that front, the way we could encourage our brothers and sisters is be willing to criticize Israel when she's... And I, and I know so many are, but, but a lot of the loudest voices in the West for the last, we could say, 50, 60 years have not been in that mode. And so a Palestinian only hears Israel's awesome, Israel's glorious, never hears, hey, Israel, fix that. Like, you're still unrighteous government like the rest of the nations. You're not as bad as the UN makes you out to be by any means. But so I think one is just fair criticism, you know, some, you know. And fair, fair there being the important term. Fair is a, no, fair is a key word. Absolutely. We don't, we're not demonizing Israel, but being willing to go, hey, we support Israel here, but Israel, stop this, you know, and, and, and again, like we said, in a fair way. The second thing is, I think the Western church has, and I know you care a lot about this. I think, again, in, our, in, in kind of the pro-Israel stance, particularly in America in the last 50, 60 years, they've created this mutually exclusive idea that if I love Israel, I'm contending with the Arab world. Mm. And of course, you know, there's some natural reasons. They go, well, what about radical Islam? What about Islamic terrorism? What about, um, and, and I think the other, so I think one is fair criticism where it needs to be. But this, uh, the second one would be, I think we need to have a much more intentional outreach, and, and by outreach I mean building relationships, um, supporting in practical ways believers in the Arab world. Mm-hmm. And I think that, again, because when you're friends with someone, the argument can be very different. So if there's an Arab believer that goes, man, your church has supported us, you've stood with us, you've encouraged us, you're praying for us, why are you guys voting for, you know, why do you guys support this? That's a very different conversation mm-hmm. than in Arab kind of going, you Western Christians don't talk to us, you don't relate to us, and now mm-hmm. you're doing. So I, I think we need to build that intentional bridge of outreach and support and go, you know what, you're part of the church, I'm part of the church. We're together, even if we don't agree on Israel. Mm-hmm. You're my brother and we're in the same body. I think that would change the conversation some. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah, if you have no relationship whatsoever with the Arabs and then... Um, you know, you do something which could potentially bring about more difficulties for them and their children and their life and so forth, um, then it stings. But if they know that you're with them, that you're building relationship, you're supporting. Now, here's the challenge from my perspective um, is there's such a, the, the pool of Arab believers, again, in the West Bank and, you know, in the Palestinian territories, who hold to a proper theology, which is they don't embrace replacement theology. They're not um, out there sort of demonizing Israel. I mean, there were even some prominent leaders, you know, from sort of the Bethlehem Bible College kind of thing that were putting out, you know, these type of cartoons, the propaganda cartoons, which cast Israel in this very, really uh, a, a demonized light. You know, they're just almost like the cartoons portray Israel as basically Nazis. And so we want to get behind and build relationships with Arab believers. And this is one of the keys um, that I've emphasized is, is as believers, we want to build and support Arab believers. We want to build relationships with and support Arab believers just as much as we're building relationships with and supporting Messianic congregations because they're both persecuted minorities within their larger uh, society. But specifically, we want to identify and support those Arab believers, not simply because they all have all of their theology exactly like ours, but at the very least, they do reject this inherently racist um, theology called replacement theology. When I say that, that can sometimes, when I use the term racist, that can upset people. They go, I'm not racist. I'm not saying if you're a replacement, if you hold to replacement theology, that you're you're a visceral racist, that you feel hatred. What I'm saying is that it is a theological system um, whereby you have inherent structural racism built in. You know, when a theology says God has permanently forever rejected this people, he has dissolved them, and I am, you know, that the Whitfields no longer exist, I am the new Whitfield. Um, God has willed that you are permanently 
um, dispersed among the nations to be punished forever because of your uh, rejection of, of Messiah, that is inherently racist. So that's what I mean by that, is we want to identify those who reject uh, theological, structural racism, and we want to identify those who are at least making efforts toward reconciliation. Again, I want to be clear, they don't have to have all of the theology exactly like you and me, but those who are making deliberate efforts toward reconciliation, we want to identify those, get behind them in particular, and so this has been one of the things, by the way, that I so appreciate about the One King Conference is that when we go to Jerusalem, when we go to Israel each year, we're meeting with uh, Messianic ministries and believers, uh, but we're also meeting with a handful of, and these are the ones that we can't advertise, um, that we're meeting with a handful of superb, outstanding, quality Arab voices who they understand the theology, they, they understand the theological issues there. They reject replacement theology. They understand God's ongoing promise plan with regard to Israel. They understand the future of Israel, etc. They're pushing for reconciliation, but they're not naive concerning the challenges. Sure. And, um, and that's been a blessing for me. It's been one of the highlights, in fact, of the One King the past few years is to connect with some of these Arab leaders and voices. And I think sometimes some of our our brethren here in the United States or in the West, they sort of act as though all of the leadership of the Palestinian church are all reject Jerusalem as the capital and, and that sort of thing. And that's simply not true. Um, the problem is many of these voices, they're simply not able to project as loudly because it will bring significant persecution, not only from their Muslim neighbors, but even from many of their Christian neighbors. No, I think, I think one thing you said I appreciated, which is, you know, there, there's a lot of Arab believers that we can build friendship with and go, do we agree with every political point about Israel? I don't know. Like, for me, I look at the, the Palestinian world, the Arab world, and I go, I'm not going to give you a litmus test on the Israeli government. What I want to go is, um, have you received Jesus, heart transformation part of the church? Then you're my brother, even if we disagree on this. Yeah. And what I notice is when you, uh, a lot of the... Uh, the political antagonism kind of sometimes comes from traditional Christian communities, non-evangelical. When you touch the Arab-Palestinian world that's more evangelical, more you'll find uh, they, one, where they agree with the state of Israel, there's this desire to, okay, how do we make a friendship with Jewish believers? How do we do that? There's a commitment to how do I evangelize my people? When I see that, I go, hey, we're part of the same church. And we may have differences on Israel. I think the Lord will sort it out. Um, but there is a vibrant church community like that that I think we need to get behind. And, you know, one of the things that encouraged me is reading Paul and noticing in Romans 9 through 11, when Paul spoke to the Romans about what we would call the replacement theology, it's interesting to me that Paul didn't treat them as completely outside the church. He said, you're a little ignorant and arrogant. In other words, he's going, hey, this is a conversation in the family. And I think we need to sometimes approach... Well, he, to be the, fair, he says, he, says, he's, he says, don't become too arrogant or ignorant. If you do, you could be cut off. Right. So he war- there's a serious warning, but he's, he's warning them not to go there. Right. And so I think it helps to, affect, to approach the conversation sometimes. As, in other words, I'll say it this way. It's interesting. I had a... Actually, an Arab believer that, that loves Israel said to me one time, said, why is the first conversation I have with every Western Christian, do you like Israel? Where, where do you stand politically on Israel? And she went, I thought we're in the same body. And we have a conversation, but why is this the litmus test? And to your point, it's going to become a significant issue, more significant. But I, I, I noticed, wait a minute, when Paul addressed him, Paul made this assumption, we're in the same family, we have a conversation we have to have, but don't be ignorant or arrogant, that's going to... but." He made that assumption of being in the same family, I think, is a helpful starting point. Mm-hmm. And I think for us, for, and I'm speaking to us in terms of a Western sense, I think it's because there's multiple layers piled on top. In other words, how do I relate to Israel politically versus Iraq and Syria and Iran? And then there's how do I relate to Jew versus Arab? And then there's, well, what about terrorism? And what about, like, all these factors are, I think, are swirling in our conversation. And so it becomes difficult to just kind of clear the air and go, oh, you're a follower of Jesus okay, um, you may be in a country that my country's got tension with, but how do we relate in the same family and how are we going to deal with differences and things like that? Right, right. And another thing, too, is, you know, 
we, we're all called, it doesn't matter, you know, in our marriage relationships and it really in any relationship, we're called to be listeners. Um, but the difficulty with that is that if you listen to the wrong people, then, you know, and so this is, uh, again, one of the things that I appreciate. And uh, even just in mentioning that conversation, I can almost I can almost guess in terms of who you're referring to. But I want to listen to the Palestinian believers. I want to hear them. I want to hear their side of the story. Because as Americans, inevitably, we're detached from, you know, the, the, the culture, the society, all of the tensions and the different things in the state of Israel. So we want to listen to and hear um, from Messianic believers, but we want to hear from Arab believers. But I want to listen to Arab believers that I trust. Mm-hmm. And what that means is, you know, um, those, again, who you know their heart has been touched. Mm -hmm. And when you hear the story of some of the Arabs, they go, look, this is what I was raised under. This is what I was taught. But as I came to the scriptures, I realized there were some problems here. And I realized my heart was not right. And they go, but that doesn't do away with some of these other issues. The challenges, sure. One of the things that impacted me, that stuck with me, was a simple passing statement, really was one of the young messianic believers that were sharing last year at One King. And he said, you know, it's so hard. He said, if there's, he he was listing the things that we can pray for. And he said, it was actually a few things stuck with me. But one of the things he said is he said, pray for our young people. Um, I think he said they lose, the messianic believers lose at least half of their kids in the IDF. He said, when they go into the IDF, they leave the faith. Um, the pressure of those couple years in the IDF, the isolation. He said that's usually when mo- a lot of the Messianic believers fall away. And then he said, and pray for this issue of reconciliation. He said, it's so hard. He said, we as a ministry are constantly working toward reconciliation and, and, and living that body life with our Arab believers. He said, but then something happens politically in the news. And he said, and this is, this is what stuck with me. And then he said, and the divisions happen because things get said on social media. He said... Wow. You know, all of a sudden, some political thing happens. People start arguing on social media. He goes, we make three steps forward. We have a conference. We have all the sweet time. And then all of a sudden, we make five steps backwards. Wow. And, uh, and it was interesting to think, yeah, that in Israel, Facebook, Twitter, you know, that that's where relationships get broken. Wow. When this is one of the primary efforts of the, uh, the, the, the Messianic community and the Arab community there is working toward living that unified body life. And then um, the divisions often happen around political. It was just something, it was a learning, uh, it was a learning anecdote for me because that same thing happens here in the United States. You go, wow. yeah, well, that's how it works here. But you don't always think of it no, it's well. as that's... unfolding uh, in Israel. So give the folks um, sort of a little advertisement for One King this year. This is now... It's our fourth year. Fourth year. And uh, tell, tell everyone who's going to be there and what, what they can expect if they sign up this year. Yeah, this is our fourth year. We've, we've done One King. And, you know, when we began One King, we, we, we just knew... Uh, the issue of Israel, the question of Israel, and, and I like to say not just Israel, but Israel and the Middle East and the Muslim world. It, you know, it's, it's even a, a bigger issue than that is affecting all the nations. The Bible tells us it's only going to affect us more. So it's important we have clarity. And how do we get clarity just from, like you said, a few social media posts that, that might be helpful and might not be helpful? There's just something to experiencing it. And so we've designed kind of the experience around you get to of course, see Israel. Everyone wants to see Israel, and, and it, it sounds cheesy, but it's true. It changes the way you read the Bible when you, when you see things. But also get the chance to interact with what I call the untold story, which are the believers in the land, the believers Joel's talking about, the, the Messianic believers, Arab believers that are laboring together, working together to see reconciliation, to see uh, the expansion of the gospel. And, you know, one burden that's really been on our heart is that Uh, because this issue is going to become more and more intense, that we always like to invite young people. If there's any way, you know, as a young adult for you to come, to come. And I like to challenge um, grandparents or maybe middle-aged adults, hey, you know, maybe you've been to Israel or you're thinking, man, I'd love to go to Israel. What if you took those funds and actually made a way for a college student, a young married couple to come? Because this issue is going to affect them even more intensely in the next 10 or 20 years. I mean, as we've seen with the announcement on Jerusalem, it's only going to become more explosive. So I always like to challenge, consider 
maybe paying half of a way or helping uh, a young adult uh, or someone who's kind of uh, kind of in that younger stage of life come and actually get clarity, get understanding, so they can actually then become a voice and, and impact others. So you can find out all the information at oneking 2018 Com. We'd love to have you. All the information's there. It's at the end of June going into the first part of July. Folks from all over the nations come, so it's sometimes it's fun just to see who comes. Like the, many of the other participants, you'll meet new friends from different countries. And, uh, you know, I think one of the key statements last year that really touched me is someone came up to me and they said, after hearing one of our speakers, said, I didn't know people like this existed in the world. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's a chance to really get not just experience Israel during her 70th anniversary. Right. I mean, what a critical moment, but also to experience what God's doing that many times we don't hear in the nations and how we can connect to that and uh, get understanding so that you can then be uh, an encouragement to others in your sphere of influence. Amen. Amen. So One King 2018, mm-hmm. um, and it's going to be at the end of June? It's the end of June, June 22nd through July 1st. Okay, through July 1st. And by the, by the way, the reason that it's in the summer is specifically to make it available for students, young people. They're not the only ones that come by any means. If you're older, don't think that you'll you know, be the only person over 40 um, uh, or 50 or 60. You know, there's plenty of people that come. I was going to make a joke about myself, but um, we're over 40. So it's, it's, we make it available timing-wise so that young people can come when it's not during uh, school um, and it's a little hotter than other times of the year, but it's a fantastic time. Um, again, is it going to be held at the normal location? Yes. Okay. So Christchurch, I mean, this historical, Christchurch is actually, I believe, the oldest church, the oldest Protestant church. In the Middle East. In the Middle East, mm-hmm. uh, right inside the Jaffa Gate. A lot of people don't know that it's there because you have to sort of go, once you come into the old city, there's a gate that you go through. It's beautiful. The, the worship is amazing. And so who is going to be there in terms of um, guest speakers? So guest speakers this year, of course, uh, this guy named Joel Richardson's coming. Heard of him. Yeah, I've heard he's pretty good. We'll see how he does. Joel will be there. I'll be there. Uh, Stuart Greaves uh, is coming this year. Uh, a man named Jason Chua from Singapore, actually the leader of a kind of prayer and missions organization in Singapore is coming this year. And then uh, we have the, the, really some of the most special speakers, some of our local speakers that uh, not just from Israel, but from the region as well. And so some of them, they, because of the work or where, the, where they're working, uh, we can't put their names online, but, but uh, they actually kind of touch you the most. So actually, so, so actually there'll be a, quite a number of speakers um, from the region that I think, well, they always have a very unique impact. Like I said, one, last year I heard one of the participants said, I've didn't know these people existed. And so it's really a beautiful thing about what God's doing in the region. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, and then let's hit on it again. So February 22nd through 24th, Fort Pierce, Florida. What's the name of the church that it's at? So uh, it's being, the, the building that's hosting it is Open Doors House of Prayer. Okay. Um, you can find more information about this if you go to oneking.global. That website has the details. But uh, it's right there in Fort Pierce. Myself, Joel, uh, Stuart Greaves, who will also be at Israel in the summer, and then Jay Thomas is leading worship for that. And again, feel free if you could come for the whole thing, or if uh, you just want to, if you're able to just slip away for a for a day, uh, we'd love to have you. That we want to tackle Islam, Israel, nationalism. How, how do you know with all these things moving? How do we get a clear biblical understanding? Some of our sessions will be more discussion based, so it'll be a chance to hear some good teaching, but also interact together around the Word. Amen. Amen. All right, friends. Well, thanks so much for uh, joining this week, joining us this week. Uh, as always, it's a blessing. Look forward to seeing you next week. Until then, I'm Joel Richardson, and this is the Underground.